Okay, our last uh, video lecture for chapter 19 here in unit 3. <clears throat> We're going to talk about a really important homeostatic imbalance due to extremely low blood pressure, and that is circulatory shock. Okay, so circulatory shock. Blood is not circulating normally. Tissues are not being perfused when vital organs are no longer perfused. Uh, they're going to stop functioning. The cells are going to die, and, and uh, you're going to die as a result. So circulatory shock results in inactive or in um, insufficient blood flow. There are three major types of shock. One is hypovolemic shock. So hypo means low. Volemic refers to blood volume. So anything that causes you to lose excessive amounts of blood, that's going to lower your blood volume. We already know that blood volume is one of the three things that determines your blood pressure. And... Um, so if you have less blood flowing through your blood vessels, your blood pressure is going to be lower. <clears throat> Vascular shock occurs from things that cause extreme vasodilation. Okay, that would be vascular shock. Um, peripheral resistance is one of the three things that determines blood pressure. So if you have uh, blood vessels that are dilated throughout the body all at one time, that's going to greatly lower your peripheral resistance. That's going to lower your blood pressure. And if it's low enough, you'll go into shock from that. Um, some things you guys are likely to encounter that might cause vascular shock would be certain types of infections, especially bacterial infections, can lead to that condition. That's one thing. Another thing that can lead to it are extreme allergic reactions. When somebody goes into systemic anaphylaxis, uh, we'll talk more about that when we cover the immune system. That results in inflammation across the, the whole body at one time. And one of the things that happens when you have inflammation is your blood vessels dilate to increase blood flow to inflamed areas. Well, if that's occurring all across your body at one time due to a severe allergic reaction or some types of infections, your blood pressure is going to drop. You're going to wind up going into shock. Then finally, you can have cardiogenic shock. So the third thing that controls your blood pressure is cardiac output. So if your heart is inefficient, your cardiac output is too low, that can eventually lead you to wind up going into uh, shock as well. And you can die from that. Okay, this is a, um, a really good little figure from your textbook, which is good to walk through and just um, you know make sure you can kind of follow the logic and the reasoning on this and we'll have some um, clinical applications that we can discuss on Piazza to apply some of this information <clears throat> but um, things that events and signs that can occur due to hypovolemic shock so on this diagram if you follow along in pink here are things that can lead to um, or that occur stimuli that occur when you go into shock so things like you're having inadequate tissue perfusion your cells are starving for oxygen and nutrients and so because your cells don't have enough oxygen gas they wind up having to resort to anaerobic type metabolism that's an alternative inefficient method for making their ATP uh, you learned about that when you studied the muscular system and lactic acid is a waste product that accumulates from that type of thing. <clears throat> also, if you have lowered amounts of fluid in the blood, then <clears throat> you have reduced hydrostatic pressure in the blood. So we were just talking about in the last video lecture that hydrostatic pressure is important for balancing fluid levels between uh, the tissues and the blood. So lower uh, uh, fluid levels in your blood is going to tend to result in fluid being um, pushed out of your tissues and back into the capillaries <clears throat> as well. So your tissues will wind up dehydrating when you are uh, when you have hypovolemic shock going on. And so this is going to show you, all right, so when the body detects these types of things going on, here are the responses 
that are generating, generated, the physiological responses. And down here in purple, these are the signs and the symptoms that you would observe on a patient due to these physiological responses. And uh, what we're trying to do is achieve this result over here. We're trying, the body is trying to maintain blood pressure. Now it's not always successful. At first, uh, when you when something bad is happening to a patient, like you're bleeding, you know, early on in bleeding, these types of things will um, lead to these signs and symptoms, but hopefully will allow blood pressure to be maintained. But if you keep bleeding, you keep bleeding, you keep keep bleeding, and you wind up going into hypovolemic shock, uh, this is no longer working, and your blood pressure may stay too low anyway. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all of these. Try to follow through this figure yourself and make sure that you understand what's going on. But let's just let's follow one of these here, for example. If you have a patient who's experiencing some bleeding and these types of things are happening, uh, one of the things that's going to occur, remember your baroreceptors, um, they're going to detect that reduced blood pressure. Okay, so they're going to uh, the cardiovascular control centers in the medulla are going to respond by increasing sympathetic nervous system activity. You're going to have cardio acceleratory uh, nervous nerves are going to stimulate the heart. The vasomotor center is going to send increased signals to the blood vessels so that they will constrict. So you're going to have an increase in sympathetic nervous system activity. That's going to lead to an increased heart rate. So what you would observe in your patient is tachycardia. Remember that's an increased heart rate. <clears throat> a thready pulse. So the heart rate is fast. The pulse is going to feel kind of thready because you have a lowering blood volume that's occurring. Okay. Another thing that's going to happen, the sympathetic nervous system is going to tell blood vessels, peripheral blood vessels, constrict. Let's increase that peripheral resistance. And um, <clears throat> that's going to likely to occur all throughout the body. Notice your heart and your brain are spared. That makes sense. You can't decrease the blood flow to the heart and the brain or you'll, you'll wind up dying anyway. So notice one of the signs or symptoms in a patient would be that the skin becomes cold and clammy because you have decreased blood flow to the surface of the skin because you're trying to conserve blood for the heart and the brain um, as you increase the blood pressure. Cyanotic, that's a bluish color that can develop in tissues because they have low oxygen levels. Um, <clears throat> this intense vasoconstriction, something else that's going to happen, that's going to decrease blood flow to the kidneys. And remember your kidneys detect this lowered blood flow, this lowered blood pressure, that triggers them to release renin. Renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin uh, 1 gets converted to angiotensin 2 by ACE in the bloodstream. And then as you, if you guys remember, angiotensin 2 does all kinds of things to help you uh, maintain your blood pressure or increase your blood pressure. And some of those things are going to lead to a decreased urine output. So that would be something you would observe in a patient as well. Uh, if you have hypovolemia, it makes sense a patient is going to feel thirsty uh, because those thirst centers in the hypothalamus are going to be triggered to try to get a patient to take in more fluids and increase their blood volume. So, you know, take a look at this figure and try to follow what's going on and see if you can kind of put the stories together based on what we've been covering uh, throughout this chapter. This is a very important chapter, so um, you know, be sure you look carefully at the study guide, the study recommendations I've given you about testing for this particular unit. And also don't delay, if you haven't already, don't delay studying the blood vessel anatomy and the blood drop tracings that are part of those exercises as well. Uh, good luck if you have any questions. This tends to be kind of one of the more complex topics in anatomy and physiology, so please post any questions you may have on Piazza so that we can all uh, discuss them together and everybody can benefit.